Okay. Um, before, as we about, about to, are we about to enter the uh, second session, um, I have a few words that I'd like to share on behalf of Herta Prost, who is the representative of the government of Flanders to the USA, um, and from Flanders House, who had wanted to be here today and sends his regrets, um, but he did ask me to share a few words with you. The general representation of the government of Flanders to the U.S., promotes a better understanding of the region of Flanders and Belgium, including its culture, history, government research, education, and innovation, and aims to be a gateway between Flanders and the U.S. The offices of Flanders House are in New York, um, and they have been a generous sponsor of our symposium today, um, and provide a wonderful a place for cultural events uh, regarding Flemish art, music, and culture. In the years to come, it will be a highlight of a number of Flemish masters from 2018 to 2020. So Rubens, uh, who we'll hear about shortly, will be celebrated in 2018, Bruegel in 2019, and Jan van Eyck in 2020. And Gert has wished to say that um, Flanders House has been very, very happy and proud to emphasize the central role of Flemish art in our symposium today and to encourage um, and promote Flemish art to an important future generation of scholars. Um, and he wishes a good symposium. So now we can actually turn to Rubens. And I am really delighted to welcome Alejandro Vergara from the Prado uh, today as our next speaker. Alejandro is senior curator of Flemish and Northern paintings at the Prado in Madrid. He received his doctorate in art history from New York University's Institute of Fine Arts in 1994 with a dissertation which was later published as Rubens and his Spanish patrons. He is a specialist on Rubens and on 17th century Flemish painting as well as Flemish paintings from the 16th century. He has published widely on these subjects. Before coming to the Prado in 2003, Alejandro was a professor at the University of California, San Diego, and at Columbia University in New York. His exhibitions at the Prado, and there are many, and I'll just name a few here, include Vermeer and the Dutch Interior, Rubens, the Adoration of the Magi, Patineer and the Invention of Landscape, Rembrandt, Painter of Stories, the Young Van Dyke, and recently Rubens, The Triumph of the Eucharist. His latest exhibition project and publication examines the art of Clara Paters, shown right now in the Ruckhoek's house in Antwerp and will later um, in October move to the Prado. He'll speak to us today on a subject exempt from indecency, Rubens's news for the Spanish king. Please welcome Alejandro. Thank you, Lara. Thank you all for being here, and thanks to Clark for inviting me, um, and also for putting together this amazing show. I don't think we've ever lent an equivalent number of paintings to any museum around the world uh, of this quality. It really is a, a, a great coup on the side of the Clark, and I congratulate you on that, and, and, uh, and thank you again for bringing me here. Um, Rubens came to Madrid in 1603 for the first time to Spain. The court was then in Valladolid and traveled through Madrid and wrote about the incredible amount of masterpieces by Raphael Titian and others, he said, that he had seen in the royal collections, then the largest collection of paintings in Europe and the largest collection of erotic mythologies in Europe as well. There he would have seen the painting on, the, on the, your left in the screen, which is in this exhibition, of course, and he would have seen a number of the Titians that remain in the Prado, he would have also seen some paintings that left in the early 19th century, such as the so-called Pardo Venus, because of the Pardo Palace in Madrid, where it used to be housed, the Venus in Antiope. Paintings like these, of course, made up the, one of the, the niches of collecting in Europe, and Rubens would have already known that elite collectors wanted erotic mythologies, paintings of mythologies that were sexually charged and that were mainly meant to be enjoyed by men. And you find very often, as in these cases, man conspicuously looking or man very conspicuously uncovering the naked bodies of women in paintings such as these. Rubens made his career in the second decade of the 17th century and eventually would become the most famous, renowned, uh, successful painter in all of Europe, no doubt about it, at least in the eyes of the contemporaries. Nowadays, if you want to 
organize an exhibition on a 17th century painter and you want to have very large queues, it's more likely to happen with Caravaggio or Rembrandt, Vermeer, Velázquez maybe. But at the time, it's far and away Rubens is the great star. And this career that leads him to that role uh, happens by and large throughout the second decade of the century. He becomes one of the leading painters of the message of the Counter-Reformation, a uh, leading painter of court portraits as well and court decoration, but also he takes on the role of the continuator of Titian as a painter of erotic mythologies. And we find a number of paintings such as these with these naked bodies of women pressing themselves against men, uh, painted from pretty early on in his career. Uh, he will make a, a living doing this kind of image on the left. Uh, Mars received as he arrives home from war at the Getty, and on the right, a Venus and Adonis, which is in a museum in Stuttgart in Germany. In 1618, Rubens writes a letter to a prospective client in England whom he's negotiating in an exchange of paintings with ancient sculptures, uh, and he tells them about one painting in particular, a painting of Achilles, which has been painted, he says, by his best pupil, entirely retouched by my hand, Rubens writes, and he goes on to say that it's full of very beautiful young women, leaving no doubt that this idea of showing attractive women, naked if possible, is a very obvious selling pitch at the time for paintings. Uh, one way in which you can make a career is by specializing in images of this type. This is the painting that I show you on the left, possibly painted by Van Dyck, but that's not what we're concerned with here. The painting ended up in the Spanish Royal Collection in 1625. We're not sure exactly how it entered there, but it was inventoried in Madrid in that year. And it shows a story from the youth of Achilles, written not by Homer, of course, who starts in the Iliad with Achilles as an adult or a young adult, but it's written later on by the Roman poet Stasius, who writes on the youth of Achilles and tells us that after being reared by the centaur Chiron, um, Achilles, uh, Achilles' mother, the nymph Tetis, hears about the fact that he will either live a, a, an unsignificant life or live a life of glory but die young, and she decides to hide him in the island of Skidos among the daughters of King Lycomedes. And this is the story that Rubens uh, chooses to paint here. He's been hidden in a place, hidden from view. And at the time of the beginning of the war of Greece against Troy, uh, Ulysses and Diomedes, knowing that um, the only Greek soldier who can defeat Hector is Achilles, go out and look for him and devise a trick to find him, which is that they walk into these private chambers in the court of King Lycomedes, uh, where the princesses are kept, and they throw on the floor a series of trinkets of gifts for women, such as jewels and cloths and mirrors and so on. And among them, they hide a sword, a shield, and a, and a helmet. And at that moment, Achilles, unable to hide his military vocation, in a sense, grows up and becomes an adult and will go meet his destiny, which is victory and, of course, death. This is very monumental choreography. This is Rubens trying to create these grand, ancient-like compositions. Uh, we are, we're really given the role of, of onlookers here. We are looking into a space that's private for girls, and we're uh, made in a way, I think, to emphasize, emphasize with, with Ulysses and Diomedes, we have found them. We have looked into the place where they were hidden. But it's basically an image in which we are, we are given the roles of onlookers. On the right is an image that reminds us of the fact that a lot of these paintings that we will be talking about today and the paintings in the show downstairs are really not only about eroticism, but they're about love. And they're about poetic versions of love. Um, Rubens painted the same story again about 15 years later. This is a large, very finished sketch for a set of tapestries where he's telling the same story, but he adds a little little ingredient to the story here. Stasius writes about how, um, forget the name of one of the daughters of the king, has fallen in love with Achilles and she's fallen pregnant. And the only son that Achilles will have in his life will be the son that she will bear, Deidamia. And even though in the left we see, you can have a sense of, of longing in, in her uh, gaze, uh, he seems unaware in the painting on the right Achilles is looking back at her, and you have a greater sense of not only the future, which is, you know, the story is the classic story of meeting destiny and growing up, 
Uh, but you have a sense also of loss, of what will be lost. And this matters to Rubens. And on the, on the bottom of that slide, right in that area there, there's a detail that in typical Rubens fashion, he very often, or sometimes at least, adds little symbols and little elements in his paintings that are like little texts that explain to us what's going on. Well, what we see in the bottom of that painting is a burning heart, and really beautifully painted burning heart, too. This is a painting of Rubens and workshop, but this is very clearly animated, burning, with heat emanating from the heart, and that is what the painting is about. It's about love and the loss of love that will ensue in this story. And that really is a, a, a very key ingredient in the art of Rubens and in these erotic mythologies that, again, I think it's important not to lose sight of. Uh, one of the reviews of this show that I read had a title that read something along the lines of Pornography Fit for Kings. And I think, you know, I, I have found myself in the past uh, telling people to look at these pictures in that way because I think it is a good way of connecting art to life. But it's also a way that falls well short of what the meaning of these things was at the time. And we have to keep in mind that we are talking about a culture that is very well versed in antiquity and that understands personal feelings through categories that very often come from antiquity. And that we're in the realm of something that in order to have people understand things we could call pornography maybe, but also in the realm of poetry and poetry that deals with love. Um, in 1628, Rubens arrived in Madrid for his second trip. Uh, he'd been born in 1577. He was now a painter who'd been working as not only a painter, but an advisor for the woman who ruled the Spanish Netherlands, who was the daughter of King Philip II, who we've been hearing a lot about recently. And, she, and he had become a political advisor to her, and in that role had engaged in conversations towards a peace treaty with representatives of the English king and was called by the king of Spain, Philip IV, to the court in Madrid to inform on the state of those negotiations. He stayed in Madrid for nine months and painted extensively. When he arrived in Madrid, he came with eight paintings paid for by the court in Brussels. We're not sure how that happened, if it was a commission or if he was offering these pictures to the king, but they were paid actually in Brussels. And among those paintings was the one that we see here on the screen. And when he arrived in Madrid with paintings like this, he ran into attitudes about nudity and sexuality that were common to all of Europe at the time. And there are attitudes that we find expressed in paintings such as these. In the background, Bosch's famous Garden of Earthly Delights from about 1500, where you see a middle pool of women based on the model of Venus, this nude, long, blonde-haired woman, around which we see a constellation of sins swirling as if ignited by desire towards them. And in the picture on the right, a Patineer and Quintin Metzai's painting also in the Prado, you see women as the source of temptation. And in the far right, barely visible there, right around there, you see the figure of a similar figure to what we saw in one of the early statues earlier on today, of the figure of Venus wringing her hair born from the sea as the source of temptation. There are many, many testimonies uh, that demonstrate to us attitudes towards nudity at the time, and I'm just gonna go through a few of them just to remind us of something that to some extent is obvious. Dante already in the early 14th century writes about um, swirling down into the depths of hell, and in one of these circles he finds carnal, sin carnal sinners, he says, people who let appetite rule reason. And a little bit of that kind of image is what we see Bosch, Bosch painting. Juan Luis Vives in the early 16th century, widely published and translated, writes about how nature itself takes care of decency. Nature is uh, decorous. And he says, citing Pliny as a source, then when women die at sea, they float face down. And if men die at sea, they float, fa they, they float face up. We know, by the way, that that's not true. <laughs> but he cited Pliny as an authority of that. And Pope Clement VII in 1520s uh, sent uh, Marc Antonio Raimondi to prison for having made prints and sold prints after Giulio Romano's erotic paintings. And Clement VIII in 1596 decreed that indecent paintings should be burnt. And in fact, they were in famous episodes, especially in Bologna. Uh, we know, as we've been reminded of earlier then, that when a visitor came to see the Duke of Urbino, and this is 1598, 
asked him for a copy of the na famous Naked Venus by Titian, the Duke said, you can have it if nobody finds out that I've let you do it. And keep in mind that I like the painting because it's a Titian, not because it's a nude. And in fact, the nude had become very famous, this kind of double morals of what you can say publicly and privately. Alessandro Farnese had the commissioned Titian to paint a Danae because he wanted his own picture of that type in his palace, and so did Charles V uh, later on. Um, Cassiano del Pozzo, in the same trip that, that uh, Hilliard mentioned earlier in Spain, 1626, in the entourage of Cardinal Barberini, writes about how the first wife of Philip IV, this is just a few years before Rubens' trip to Spain, every time she enters the summer section of the palace where Titian's mythologies are hung, she orders them covered. Uh, and these attitudes, again, are very, very prevalent and very often stated. But we also do have a set of, uh, an important set of literature about pornography, catalogs of good and bad bordellos in Venice and things of that nature. So both things are taking place at the same time. Um, with the Council of Trent, people writing about art in this short session at the end of this, you know, many years long council. Uh, Johannes Molanus writing from Leuven and Cardinals Paleotti and Carlo Borromeo writing from Italy, again insist on the, on the, on the, on the need to take care of morals and on the need for moral behavior. And that means, among other, among other things, not producing indecent images. And following them, people in Spain, all over Europe as well, but in Spain, like Hortensio Felix de Paravicino, who is friend of El Greco, and people of Rubens' same generation, such as Pacheco, who is Velázquez's father-in-law, and Vicente Carduccio, who is the son of one of the Italian painters that came from Florence to decorate the Escorial, they insist on the same ideas, and they, 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 bl they place blame both on clients or collectors and artists for those indecent images that do exist. And, and it is only the protection of, uh, that comes from the power of the crown, from the court, that allow people like the king and those around him, aristocrats that are close to him, to build large collections of these erotic mythologies. And it's only closeness, proximity to those people that allow painters like Rubens to be exempt from indecency uh, in producing these images. In fact, to find a very ready clientele for something that he is specializing on. Um, from the time when Rubens leaves Madrid in April of 1629 until he dies in 1640, this protection by the umbrella of the court allows the relationship between him and the young king Philip IV to be one made in heaven for the production of erotic paintings or paintings with a very strong sexual content. Rubens will paint more than 100 paintings for Philip IV between, before he dies in 1640. That's many more than he paints for any other client. It's also many more than Philip IV buys from any other painter. Uh, he will also, Philip IV will also be the largest purchaser of paintings by Rubens after his death in May of 1640 from his heirs, his wife, and his children. Uh, we know from different sources, including Rubens' own letters, but also Velázquez's father-in-law, who's uh, receiving his information from Velázquez, 22 years younger than Rubens, but sharing a studio with him in the Alcázar in the Royal Palace in Madrid, that Rubens, Pacheco tells us, copied all the Titians in the royal collection. It may be an exaggeration, but we know that he does copy a number of them. We've seen the Diana and Callisto on the right. What, the painting that you see on the left is Titian's original. What you see on the right is a drawing by Rubens, now at the J. Paul Getty Museum, which shows different studies of parts of figures of different paintings from the Poesie by Titian. And you know you can try to gain a sense of what part, what paintings were close to each other by studying images like this one. Rubens had become a widow in 1626, and he remarried in December of 1630. And he remarried uh, a girl of 16 years old when he was 53. And he wrote a letter at this time explaining uh, explaining this marriage to a friend. And he says that even though uh, he felt pressure to marry someone of higher status. He didn't want to marry someone who would feel embarrassed to see him pick up his brushes, he says. He was completely infatuated by this woman in the, in the remaining 10 years of his life. And one has a sense that he lives this, this, this second youth uh, in a, a madly in love and a type of love that has a very strong sexual component. And he's painting this kind of happiness or state of bliss that he will live from, from now on. 
What you see here is the Garden of Love, which Rubens paints and keeps in his collection, and it's purchased by the king after Rubens dies, and it's now in the Prado. We don't know exactly when he paints this, but this is clearly a, some kind of a, 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 an echo of the idea of, of marriage poems or epithalamia that Rubens is painting in connection to his wedding. What you see here is uh, a garden in, into which figures are being pushed in by cupids. It is presided over by a nude Venus born from the sea, sitting on a dolphin, with the three graces in the background, the figures that often adorn the figure of Venus. On top of, above the scene, you see these two cupids, the little gods of love, and above them, two pigeons, which indicate that this love is about union. They're united by a red ribbon. In front of them, in front of them another one of these little flying angels, in this case, holding a marriage or matrimonial floral wreath or crown and a matrimonial torch, so another reference to uh, the actual act of marriage. What Rubens is painting here is a, a world in which mythological figures, mythological statues, and people in contemporary dress mingle. It's really an ideal place, and it's a place where love implies uh, you know, the, the, the growth that comes with spring and abundance and fertility, especially well expressed, I think, in this absolutely beautiful, beautiful landscape uh, in the background. Think about the difference between this view that we are offered in the Garden of Love and the view that we find in another one of Bosch's paintings, the Haywain, where in the middle of the picture we find a group of kind of merrymakers, a group of a man playing a musical instrument involved in um, kind of flirtatious, amorous play. Uh, in this case, however, this means that they have fallen prey to the devil, and this causes this angel to, to pray to Christ above. It's a very negative view of the same thing. Rubens, hyper-Christian, orthodox, traditional, at the same time, is really writing a tradition and an understanding of life and love that comes from classical antiquity. And it's this ingredient that makes him fundamentally different from this understanding of, of this sort of issue that we see so clearly in Bosch. Another painting that I believe is to be seen as a type of epithalamia is the Three Graces, also in the Prado, also painted uh, by Rubens for himself. Huge production, major wood panel. Um, strange, interesting that Rubens is painting these major works for himself, not for sale, and he owns this when he dies. And it only arrives in the Spanish Royal Collection shortly after he dies in the 1640s. And again here, what we find is figures that tell us about uh, beauty, love, and ideas of beauty and love that imply uh, fertility, abundance, procreation, sexual, temp sexual uh, attractiveness, temptation, all these ingredients mixed into one. You see this outpour coming from the fountain with the little cupid. The, if you look at this very closely, you can't see it in this picture, but there's a little wing behind that figure. Uh, so it is a, a cupid. Um, among the paintings that Rubens copied in Madrid, as I mentioned, is the, the Diana and Callisto. He painted for himself a version of this later in life that again he kept in his collection and that again uh, King Philip IV purchased from his heirs, which is the picture that I show you on the right now in the Prado. It shows a, a I, th I think, a more a different type of feeling than what we see in the original. The original is dramatic, tragic, uh, but we seem to be given the roles of onlookers, again, it seems to me, in that image by Titian. In the image by Rubens, we find sympathy. We find that Diana, instead of the terrible figure who's punishing the victim of the rape of, of Jupiter, who had been disguised as Diana, as he raped her in order to gain access to her. We see that Diana here is, kind of, is hurting, is, is, is sorry for what has happened. Um, Callisto, of course, will give birth to Arcas, and then she will be expelled from the retinue of the goddess. All the nymphs that, all that um, you know, roam the forest with Diana have to promise to be virgins when they form part of her retinue. And again, I, I find a, there's a, a, an empathy on the side of Rubens towards these stories that suddenly 
implies that there's overlapping attitudes towards these things. We look at what we see as man, and the picture is sellable, probably one must think, or it's made with that in mind to some extent. But at the same time, these are stories that are felt by a man who has ideas about love and feelings of that sort, and that is, um, that those ideas are informed again by, by classical antiquity and classical poetry. In 1638, there's a series of letters back and forth between King Philip IV and his brother, who is now governor of the Spanish Netherlands, the Cardinal Infante Ferdinand. And Ferdinand tells him about a number of paintings that he's, Rubens is working on for, Rube, for Philip IV, who's becoming a completely obsessive client at this point. And he tells him that he's just finished one painting, but it has a problem, and that problem is excessive nudity. And it's rather odd in this context, which includes the commission of some of the paintings that you see downstairs, that the Cardinal Infante would be worried by this, but he is worried by it, at least publicly. And he says he's asked the painter to do something about it. But Rubens has answered that he can't do it, that it's necessary because of the what makes it necessary, Rubens tells the Cardinal Infante, is la valentía de la pintura, which is something hard to understand, something like the braveness or the daring of the art of painting. In order to make the painting powerful, I need that. That is um, one of the things that I want to convey. The Cardinal Infante adds in those same set of letters that the figure of Venus in the middle of the painting is a portrait of the painter's young wife. Rather amazing statement, really, that this is publicly known in Antwerp and being publicly expressed towards a client. And I see here a kind of young male bragging uh, about the, the, her, his young woman as trophy in a way not so different, by the way, to what happens nowadays among many you know, sports stars and things of that sort, really. Um, among the paintings, as you've been seeing, I've been alternating between paintings painted by Rubens for himself but purchased by the king and paintings made directly for the king. That's the case with this Diana and the, uh, uh, with nymphs and satyrs, the nymphs of Diana and satyrs, which is part of a commission of paintings to decorate parts of the Alcázar, the main royal palace in Madrid. And what Rubens expresses in this beautifully musical painting in which you see these, these kind of dancing pairs um, with very, these very dynamic ideas of life that are typical of his paintings, he's expressing, he's contrasting rather violently, really, these two ingredients of the story which are also ingredients which are in tension in sexual life and in love, which is the ideas of lust, desire on the side of the satyrs or the man, and chastity uh, on the side of the woman. And this, very interesting also to notice the difference in the colors in which they're painted. But this, this struggle is one of the defining tensions of life, this ongoing tension between uh, desire or lust and chastity. In a, uh, in, a, in a painting that is in the exhibition downstairs, we see what seems to be a resolution of this in a beautiful, peaceful moment where satyrs and nymphs coexist, where lust and beauty or physical attraction coexist in one scene. And this is, I think, the most beautiful example of uh, an idea of love that Rubens has learned from a long tradition that culminates in pastoral poetry in ancient Rome especially, but that is followed through in the Renaissance as well in Petrarca, and you find some of it in Dante as well, where you have the sense of life being made up of ingredients of which love is one of the main ones, and love being made up of ingredients which include uh, feeling and sentiment, but also include desire, uh, lust. The, these are the things that ignite life and that create life. Uh, you see the same, if you look at the background landscape here, you will see, I think, the sense of the ongoing growth of the trees where every twisting brushstroke seems to be announcing the next growth spurt and the sense that nature is, um, is this incredibly rich place that is renovated constantly every season after every winter comes spring and then comes the summer. And human beings are part of this whole, and they're part of this whole in part because of the idea of love having a sexual component and that component being about desire and fueling all this ongoing uh, engine, which is, which is um, life and this idea of, of love. And finally, I wanted to show you the slide on the right, which is a, from a picture in the Royal Museum of Fine Arts in Antwerp that I think beautifully expresses 
this notion of all the ingredients that form an idea of love informed by classical poetry and very different from uh, what we can think of or what's conveyed by the word pornography. And also, this is, what, this is the gift that Rubens offers us and that we would have lost if he and the king had not been exempt from indecency. This is, you can see that the, the touch of the satyr, satyr being desire, lust, male sexual desire and power, uh, about to touch the, the, the figure of the, of the sleeping or winter Venus in a way that's very similar to the way in which God the Father is going to touch the figure of Adam who still hasn't received his soul in the Sistine ceiling by Michelangelo. And it's that moment when lust or sexual desire touches love that ignites life. And that is the origin of, of that's what will make that night into day and that what will turn that winter uh, into spring. Thank you.